So afternoon proper, properly, everybody. Mm. Right? <laughs> yeah, I had to say afternoon to everybody to get your voice. So we're going to go on to AC Terry today. Now we need AC Terry to do digital electronics because um, this is how we get our signals. Everything in digital electronics works on alternating currents, not necessarily works on direct current. So let's look at alternating current. So reading from our screen, right? Make sure I have a good pen, All right? So alternating currents is the method by which we transfer elect electricity from a power plant to home. You all should have done this at CSEC level, but just to recall, right? At our big power plants, right? When they're creating you know, all that smoke and whatever, and they have to send out electricity to our homes. They don't send out electricity using direct current because that means you have to pump a lot of current into the um, into the wires to reach to reach the the houses. So what they do, they end up using alternating currents. And why do they use alternating currents? Because the very nature of alternating currents, meaning it is sinusoidal, so it it kind of gives itself its own kinetic energy to push forward because. A straight line takes a lot of energy to move forward. But if we get a sinusoidal curve, it's going to kind of be self-propagating, kind of. All right, so to carry um, an alternating current through our power lines makes it easier to move because, number one, we're using less current or we're using less power to transmit across our lines. And then we need alternating currents for our transformers to work. So this is the beautiful thing. You could pump a smaller amount of current. Smaller is a, rel is a relative term. Yeah? In those overhead lines, when you have 10,000 volts, 20,000 volts, right? It's still a smaller amount of current compared to providing electricity for the entire country. Think of how much electricity that is. That's a lot of current to provide for the entire um, current the entire country. So we run alternating currents through our main lines. It passes through transformers at different locations. Almost every street you all should see a transformer at the end of the street or the middle of the street. You all will see transformers anywhere, right? On your streets. If you've never noticed them, please take a look at your um, electricity poles. Rohan, there should be one pretty close to you, right? Because I know I always see one right from the physics department. If I look out into the back, I will see um a couple transformers really, you know, really close to where you are. All right, so what happens? It runs through our transformers and our transformers is going to increase that current, making it more usable for everybody on the street. So we need to use alternating currents, all right? And let's learn why, how alternating currents work. So continue reading from our handout. As a result, there are several features and terms we need to know when working when working with alternating current so just to revise let's zoom out a wee bit right you all should know your um ac generator as i will tell you all please go and revise how this works all right just to revise it so what happens we have our um coil is between a magnetic field going from north to south and this coil is going to rotate around and around. And by rotating around and around, we are going to get different directions of current flowing. Now, usually we look at this one, but here we're going to see how that direction of current is going to actually give us an alternating current. So let's say we start at zero. When we start at zero here, that means that our... Um, When we start at zero, our coil has to be flat, right? So when it is flat, that means we're gonna get no current flowing. So when our coil is completely flat or in the same orientation as the magnetic field, remember in order for an induced current to flow, your magnetic field lines have to be cut, sorry, have to be cut by the wire. If we have our magnetic lines if we have our magnetic field lines and our wire is the same direction as our magnetic field lines 
and those flux lines are not cut, we are not going to get induced current happening. So that means nothing is going to flow. So let's just check and see how this actually influences our stuff. So when our, um, here, if you look and see our coil is 90 degrees to our feed lines. So that means we're going to have maximum induced current. So we're going to get maximum voltage or current. Then it's going to spin around. And when it spins around, so it's going like this, it's going clockwise. So when it spins again, and it's now flat and in the same orientation as your fee lines, we are going to get no current forming because we have no current when our angle is zero. All right, then it's going to flip again. Now it's going to flip again. So that means the current is now coming from the opposite direction. So we're going to get a maximum on the bottom and it's going to come back and still be horizontal as long as our coil is horizontal to our fee lines no current flows and this will end up rotating again and again for this point here we're going to go up back up to up maximum then it's going to flatten back out we're going to get our coil flattened back out coming out to our device and it's going to go back to zero so we're going to always get a sinusoidal curve it's a perfect sinusoidal curve and it's actually described by a sine wave so let's look at this, continue reading waveform. An alternating current takes the form of, of a sine wave and it is described by a sine curve. So here we just looked at how the, um, the coil is rotating through a magnetic field, All right? So if this is our coil, let's see if we can get this to rotate. All right, if this is our coil here, right? We can get our coil to rotate such that it, it can be horizontal, right? It could then rotate again. Oops, sorry, let's get us to rotate again. It can rotate again, right? To give us our negative. Why is it doing that? Why, why, why? Oh, all right, it's gonna rotate again to give you your negative. Then it's going to rotate again to give you your zero. So all it's doing, it's just going to be Okay, I'm going the opposite direction, but it's just spinning around in that magnetic field. And by spinning around that coil very rapidly, we can determine how our magnetic field is going to run. So the speed that this spins with, right, it spins really, really fast. We're going to get a very, very fast alternating current. If it moves really slow, you're going to get a really long periodic motion of your wave. So this is where we have you all should remember or should recall that um, our waves, how your sine waves work out, works out. Remember, it's the same thing as doing 90, 180, 270, and 360s. Exact same thing, one sine wave or one full wave is one 360 degree curve or two pi radian curve. So the sine wave here is described by the equation I, which is your current at any time T. So if you want to write that down, I is equal to your current at any time of T. So I is equal to I naught, I naught being our initial current, sine 2 pi F T. 2 pi F, anybody can remember what symbol, what term this is in um, waves? 2 pi f is what term or what letter? Omega. Woo, though he's loud, but still, yeah, omega. All right, so remember that. And please remember that frequency is one over your periodic time. And your periodic time is the time it takes to complete one full cycle. All right, so that is our periodic time. All right is the time it takes to complete one full cycle and your frequency is one over periodic time. Time here, this little tiny time here is time at any given instant. So we can look, say we want to know what's the current at five seconds, 10 minutes converted to seconds, a millionth of a second, all right? Because some of them do rotate that quickly. Similarly, by using V is equal to IR, we get a wave 
for the variation of the voltage. Now, since V is equal to IR, and R is a constant in a circuit, remember all our circuits must have resistors in them. Resistors, as we went through the last time, are not necessarily bad things. They're there to, one, limit the amount of current flow, and two, to regulate the amount of current that flows. All right, so initially we thought resistors were bad, but we do need resistors in all our circuits in order for them to function. Look, same thing for capacitor. In order for capacitor to charge and discharge in any kind of appreciable time, you need a big resistor. All right, so here we have a resistor. Since the resistor is constant, the same change that we see in I, we are going to see in V. Let me let's zoom in here a little bit more. So you're going to get V is equal to V naught sine 2 pi FT, where V is your voltage at any time T. V naught is your initial voltage sine 2 pi FT. There are several types of wave shapes that an alternating current can take. All right, so you're going to see this. And what this usually is, this happens when we either have a very fast um, wave, when we have a complex wave. So that's when we have more than one wave interacting with each other. And then we have things like triangle and square waves. You're going to see when we start doing um, operational amplifiers. So I'm not going to jump that note twice. So you will have many different forms of your alternating current, but our pure sine wave is what we have at the top here. Remember your sine wave starts at zero, all right? So our complex wave, what a complex wave here, it's probably one wave added to another wave. And if you look into notes and just go online and Google it, you're going to realize sometimes we have multiple waves interacting in our issue. We are not asked or not required to look at multiple waves interaction, but just know that those do happen. And you see this type of question, you all want to know where this kind of question can appear in your multiple choice paper. All right. And the biggest point about this, remember, we must start at zero. And we must have time on our x axis. So, in a question like this, they're going to give you a thing here, tell you your time is two milliseconds, and they're going to ask you to find um, the frequency. All right, we'll go into questions like that a little later on. All right, but just again, this is not even Cape level physics, this is CSEC level physics where we have frequency and we could work out periodic time and vice versa. And we did do this last year anyway, right? Remember I said we're going to be repeating this in upper six and here we are just briefly because we've done it already. So root mean square, this is where it gets different. The main feature of an alternating current is that the flow, the direction of the flow changes from one direction to another, which is true. In one full wave, if I have one full wave, right? There is no time in that full wave when my current and time are replicated. It's always constantly changing as it moves along. So that means we don't have an exact I, right? We don't have an exact I because I is always changing. So that means we're going to have to make some approximations. And the simplest approximation in any kind of mathematics is called your mean or average. So let's look at it. In the sinusoidal alternating current, the, dire the direction of flow and magnitude of the current change periodically, as we can see from the sine curve. By looking at the power dissipated, looking at the power dissipated by resistor in a circuit, we know power is equal to, we did this before, is equal to I squared R. Usually it comes from the equation of power is equal to IV, but here we're going to use R because R is your constant in your circuit and usually in um in an alternating current or alternating supply both i and v are changing so we don't want to introduce our equation with two set of changing um variables let's get a constant variable and let's get a manipulated variable and our responding if you realize that's how we do our physics that's how we do our questions we don't want to get two three things changing at the same time that's just asking for a headache so power is equal to i squared R, 
For an alternating current, the current I changes for a complete cycle. So we need to find the average power and current relationship. So let's wrap our minds and brains around this. What we can do if this is our positive cycle, our positive cycle means if we take the average of any two points, right? No, find the average of these two, sorry. Where'd you come from? All right, if we take the positive curve and we want to find the average of any two points in that curve, right? Equal points. We can find the average of, how do you find average? You add up your two values, right? And you divide it by two. So this is what we're going to do. If I want to find my average power, it's going to be the average of I squared R. Just to recall, power is equal to I squared R. Seeing that R is a constant in our lab or our circuit, because let's just think I have an alternating supply here. It's running through a resistor, all right? And now it's going towards some kind of output signal, usually some kind of signal generator or signal receiver or something. All right, so what's gonna happen as my current changes up and down, up and down, up and down, my resistor is going to remain constant. So I can pull that out of the average equation. So I'm gonna get power is equal to R by I squared average or the average of I squared. Now we're going to introduce a term here called RMS. RMS means root mean square. And you're gonna see where we get root mean square from as we come down here. So you're gonna get, um, I squared, well, RMS I squared is equal to the square or the average of I squared. Now, how do I find the average of I squared? Let's just look at two values. If I have um, one point here, I, right? And I want to find the average point of just this one. What you're gonna do, you're gonna take the starting point and the end point, all right? So you're going to have, what is the average between zero and one, anybody? How do I find the average of zero and one? Then I'm 0 0.5. I didn't ask for the answer. You know, how do I find the average of zero and one? Tell me. Zero plus one divided by two. Zero plus one divided by two. So what we did, we added up our two points and we divided by two. Similarly, if I have, especially like in a sine curve, let's imagine this is a sine curve now, which is how our current varies, right? I want to find my average between two points. My I is here. My initial point would have been zero. So how would I get the average of those two points? It will be zero plus I squared naught, which is your initial current, all right, divide by two. And anything added to zero is the same thing. So your RMS is going to be your initial current squared divided by two. Now, if I squared RMS is equal to I, I naught squared over two, I want to just find I, RMS. So I'm just going to find the square root and you're going to get the square root of I naught squared over the root of two. Now, you can go and apply since it's being divided, we can split it up. So you can say I RMS is equal to the square root of I squared naught over the square root of two. You can break it up when terms are multiplying or dividing. You can take that dividing sign and break it up either over the, the divisor sign or across the multiplication sign. So what's the square root of I squared? Square root of I squared is I. So you're gonna get I naught over the square root of two. So this is how we can say that RMS is the root, root mean, right? Square of your current. It's a long term. I don't know who came up with the idea of call it root mean square, but it's the square root of your mean I squared value. That's what it means. So you're gonna get um, I RMS, is equal to I naught, which is your initial current, divided by root of two. Root of two is a is a, um, a constant value because root of any number is going to remain the same number. 
You all go ahead and work out one over the square root of two and tell me what you get. Zero point seven zero seven. You get 0 0.0707. So that means root mean square or your average I value because you have that curve going up and down is 0 0.707 of your initial value or your maximum value. So let's just look at how current actually changes because when we are doing current alternating current calculations, we don't take the maximum value like what we did for direct current remember for direct current all we did was just take the value of the battery or the value of our power supply straight and use it we can't do that for alternating currents because of the root mean square consideration why do we have the root mean square consideration because that current is constantly changing and by constantly changing we always have a different value so we need to find an average of that value Well, an effective average. So let's look here. We can have this one's meeting off the um the voltage, voltage and current, same thing. All right. So what it's going to do? It's going to reach its maximum point and then it's going to start uh, decreasing going down. So this is what we call our peak current. All right, let's just use I. All right, so our peak current is the maximum current that we can have. Peak current is your I note our effective or our RMS value is 0 0.707 of I naught. And then we have our average, our pure average of our current is just going to be I naught over two. All right, pure average is zero plus that number divided by two. Our pure average is going to be half of your initial peak current. But what we use when they look at their circuits and whatnot, they realize that they don't use the average, they use the RMS value. And the RMS value being the root mean square where we have to consider that power is equal to I squared R. And because of this I squared value, we're going to end up getting the effective current of your circuit being 0.707 of your initial value. So this is what your circuit is going to use. This is what your components are going to use and whatnot. So what to take away? What can we take away from this? You just have to remember that peak current is equal to I naught. And then we have our root mean square, RMS, is equal to um, I naught over root two. Please know you all have to know how to vary this equation a little bit because we can get i naught from rms so we can just say i naught is equal to root two by i rms and i rms the rms current is usually the value that we are stating and using in our questions we don't use the full value because that's not a true value of what's happening because of the root um the pulsating or varying nature of our sinusoidal curve all right, so these are the two most important things to remind to remember here. All right, your RMS is just 0.707 of your initial current, and your peak current can be calculated from your RMS by just multiplying by root of two. And root of two is 1.732, I think. One point seven three two. I think. Or is it one point three two? Oh one no, point, one point. One. I was thinking about the square root of five, I think. No, what is the square root? Square root of three? Square root of three all there. For shame, I forget my, my suits. All right, square root of two is 1.414. I used to know all my suits from one to 10, you know, I get old. <laughs> all right, so there is a similar term for voltage. And because voltage and current are so closely related to each other, we can say that the RMS voltage of an alternating current, because it's alternating, you have to get an average or a mean 
um, voltage, it's going to be 0 0.707 of your initial voltage. Let me see why people are harassing me. All right, so definition of, so that's basically it for current. Yeah, right, that's it for our AC theory. All right, definition of the ampere, you all can just read this through, all right, because this equation does come ever so often in exam. I'm not going to go through it too much because it's really self-explanatory. All right, really nice, simple proof to go through. So you all read it through on what is the actual definition of your ampere, all right? All right, so your ampere is the current that flows in two wires of infinite length. Infinite length doesn't mean infinity, it just means very long, all right? And negligible cross-sectional area, so A doesn't consider all right, and place one meter apart will give rise to a force of two by 10 to the minus seven newtons. So what they ha has here, I'm just gonna explain the equation. If I take two wires, put them one meter across from each other, and I have one amp of current flowing in these lines, if they are one meter apart, the two wires will experience a force of two by 10 to the minus seven newtons. That's the actual definition of an ampere. It is, we do not derive the ampere equation from V is equal to IR. We don't do that. If we look at how current and magnetism affects each other to give us the forces between two wires. So you all just go through that, all right? Read it through, all right? Sometimes you will get this equation in exams, but it's really simple to go through, all right? Because I want to go on to our PD. All right, so let's stop share there. Let's pause our recording. So our second plan and design is up and ready for you all to use. The nice thing about these plan and designs, they require a little bit of ingenuity in your setup. All right, now this is not an exact science lab. This one here, we're not gonna take exact X, exact Y. We are investigating the effect of one term on the other. So let's read and see. All right, let me get my highlighter out because we're just going to be using the highlighter. All right, so temperature affects the magnetic strength of a magnet. That is true. When it's too hot, our magnetic dipoles start to get too energetic and they lose their alignment, right? Remember, to have a magnet happen and all our dipoles have to be aligned in the same direction but once those magnet dipoles start going in all kind of other weird directions right we are going to lose our magnetism because we've lost the arrangement or the alignment of our magnetic dipoles so it has been shown that for each type of magnet so for every type of magnet that exists right there is a temperature at which that magnet can become demagnetized all right, so these are the little ceramic magnets we have in school that we all use in form four and five. That has a temperature that will demagnetize it, and it's not going to be the temperature that melts it. That temperature is way afterwards, right? And the temperature that causes a magnet to become completely demagnetized is called the Curie temperature. All right, that's just the name. So that means you all can go and find out look it up and see if you can find any oh, wow that's big marker all right an equation all right see if you can find an equation that describes curie temperature it's a really easy equation y'all all right it's a straight line to the original equation there's a tell you how easy it is all right so i want you to plan and design an experiment that can be used to show how the magnetic field strength of a magnet varies between the temperatures of zero to 200. all right is the aim of this lab going to be to determine the Curie temperature of the lab of a magnet or determine how magnetic strength varies with temperature? Reading that sentence again, you all tell me what is going to be the aim of this lab. The second one, you see, miss. Your second one. The Curie temperature is, is basically the preamble going into this lab. So I don't want anybody to come and tell me to determine the Curie temperature of a magnet. The Curie temperature of a magnet is usually like four, five, six hundred degrees Celsius. We only work in, as highlighted in the lab, between zero and 
200. We want to get to temperatures that we can get to in the lab. All right, so there are some constraints with this lab. All right, so you are to use equipment found in regular school laboratories, so no hole probe. So you're not just going to go heat up a magnet, take a hole probe. So if this is, um, so if this is your magnet, you take the hole probe, you touch it, and you get your magnetism. It's not that easy. We want to find an ingenious way to determine how we can see the effects of temperature on magnetism. All right, then we're going to discuss it. We're going to try to work it out together. This is where I said it's a little bit of ingenuity. All right, so suggested apparatus. Not You all could add more things. You can't take away anything from this. You have to add more things. All right, so you want your neobidium. I think I spelled neobidium wrong. I really do think I spelled it wrong. Let me find the proper spelling for that. Is, is, is with a D, neodymium. Or something, yeah, neobide something. Neo... Magnet. Neodymium. Neodymium. Take out this. DY. M. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> Neodymium magnet. So those are those little super strong magnets that we have in school. So that way, because we're using a super strong magnet, it's one going to hint, 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 hold our things better so we'll be able to see them. You know, they won't jostle off so easily. A clamp, a retort stand, an oil bath. This is the biggest hint I've given to you all. Well, what is a water or an oil bath? Anybody can tell me from your other subjects' knowledge what that is. Don't say something, put soap and water in a bath, eh? Jabari, that was for you. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Anybody? You, you particularly see this probably in chemistry or you would have seen it in Form 5 when you were doing the cooling curve lab. That's your next big hint. What is an um, oil bath or a water bath? They heat something? No. I think you have to place it in... Something that contains in water. Uh huh. Right, and it heat in the water. Uh huh. But the substance in the water, but it's not to, like mixed with the water. So like, you put in the oil in a test tube and you place it in a water bath, which is a container containing water. We don't need no. a water bath. Is when we have water, and this this is why I give you a big big tip of saying an oil bath. Right? Rather than using water, we can use an oil bath where we replace that water with oil. Anybody want to guess why I would want to use an oil bath as opposed to water? To reach at a higher temperature. To reach at a higher temperature and at a lower temperature. All right? So please don't use coconut oil. I'm telling you all that from now because why coconut oil freezes and becomes hard at a wrong single degrees temperatures we can use some olive oil right you can use yeah fine you can go and read it up and see what temperatures you can use your different oils at so read up on how to use an oil bath all right a suitable method for recording the temperature of the magnet all right the mere fact i'm telling you all or i'm giving you the instruction to use an oil bath you should know what an oil or a water bath does. An oil bath is simply the same thing as a water bath, except we're replacing the water with oil. There's no water in this lab whatsoever, none. So even put water in here saying that, you know, you're gonna get burned from the water or whatever, and the water gonna splash anywhere, no. All right, read up how a water bath works, and then that's gonna tell you how you are able to determine the temperature of your object. Anybody remembers using, we use water bath twice in Form 5. Um, the students were Northeastern. I don't know if the other students, if you would have, would have done that, where you put an object in boiling water to heat up that object. Yeah, we put the metal weight. Mm -hmm. That's true. That was in what, Form 5 or lower 6? 
I feel like that okay. was the most. Wait, I was way. Time is flying, you all. Right? So think about that and think about how we're going to determine the temperature of our magnet and 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 investigating how magnetic strength changes. So hint, big, 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 big hint. This is where um, you all going to have to come with your own thing. Something very small, metallic, and easy to count. Anybody want to kind of guess why I'm talking about something very small and metallic and easy to count? <laughs> We can use plenty. We can use plenty. Anybody can give me an example of something small and metallic and easy to count? Paper clips. Paper clips. Or oh, I think more than coin. Coins yeah. are not magnetic. Yeah, forget them things. No problem. They are not steel. Otherwise, you could just walk down the road with a big magnet and pull up all the coins from the road. All right, so, oh gosh, my dog is making noise. All right, so think about uh, All right, you all, just give me a sec. I'm coming back. I'll come back. Barry, how it is with the heat, the metal again in form, right? Remember we tie that string and we wait inside the water for um, our a minute or so and it was boiling. But I feel like that was in lower sex boy. You all sure that was in lower sex? But we do that in the form sex room. Die right. Have to, we have to wait first, then go and do that. So we could just do that with the magnet. Well yeah, we gotta tie it back. No, well. Um. <laughs> Remember that circular? <laughs> well, yeah, you could tie that string. Well, the tie good. You see, we lab books that are being nice and handy right now, though. Sorry about that. I hope all you were discussing stuff to do. So something small, um, very small, magnetic and easy to count. And you all could probably try to figure out how this works. All right. So what I want you all to do. Yes. Yes. But we were talking yeah. about how, how in form five we had tied the metal to a string and then dip it in the water now. So we could do the same thing for the magnet. Wait anyway. 
Um, See no more. Not that I'm some kind of um. No, I'm meaning I wanted to look for the mark, the, the marker to highlight what we're doing, right? Uh -huh. Oh, so that for the heating part. Yes. All right, so I want you, so think about what you're doing for your draft. It's going to be due Sunday at 6 p.m. I was going to do it Saturday, but Jabari will be Astro Quizzing weekend, all right? So that's just real unfair. Uh, what for Astro Quiz, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> right? Really, I was going to put it on Saturday. It's like, no, we're going to be in Astro Quiz. All right, everybody else, I'll put up the link for Astro Quiz. So for the draft on Sunday, please don't be late because I am going to mark it as I get it. Hopefully, I don't have too much things else to do. All right? Um, I want you all to give me a hypothesis. Remember, we're not looking at Curie temperature. The Curie temperature is the preamble into your topic. I want a diagram, method, and variables. Remember, um, method comes before variables in your write-up. Here, yeah, I really don't care as long as I just get it. All right? That's all I want. All right? So your draft is due on Sunday at 6 p.m. If you finish this draft today, then send it back to me to today. All right, because I figured out a way to start marking work on time. I mean, I sit down with the dogs on the ground with my laptop. <laughs> right. Um, so it's going to be Sunday, due Sunday, 6 p.m. And the final draft will be Tuesday at 10 p.m. All right. Please remember your layout for your PDs, your labs, folks. And I told you this and I said it in the classroom. I'm going to say it. All right. It must be in. In Word, if you give me a PDF document, the only thing you are going to get is your lab out of 12. You're not going to get any corrections, nothing on the lab, because I'm not going through that again of saving each picture and putting on a file. No, no, no. All right? Send me in a Word document. Please note the instructions that I gave for you all to um, proper take proper pictures of your work. So those of you all are taking pictures of your work, if that is your screen and that is your paper make sure you have a white background behind your paper meaning you could take two long sheets two legal sheets of paper and put it in the back or you could get a big drawing book page put it in the back or a really nice very flat tablecloth and put it at the back of your work i don't want to see some weird color or something take your photos close to your window people i don't want to see this kind of nonsense where this is the the page that you all are sending me. Oh, come on. All right, so if that is the page you are sending me, or oh, some people are still doing this, where it kind of bent up on the page. Don't do that now, right? The same way how if you click on your image, you see this rotational tool. If you're using a computer, you can rotate it or make sure your stuff aligned, your camera is aligned with your work, right? You all have a screen that has straight edges. Try better now, let me do better. All right, so that is the instructions for your draft, right? Your final write-up is going to be the same thing. Please send me very nice write-ups, right? And let's just see what we're doing for the other two. I did send you all, oh, let's stop the recording. No, let's continue recording because I have to talk to everybody about something. I did send out in the Google Classroom for the form class that we're going to be doing verification of our exam slips. Remember, we did this last year in law six and the year before in form five. So it's nothing new where your parents have to come sign it. This is required by CXE or by Ministry of Education. All right. Somebody has to come and sign and verify that, there is, that you are being signed up for the correct subjects. Because of the COVID-19 restrictions, we're not allowed to have, um, we have 45, 43 parents, 43 students. So we can't have all 43 parents in the school one time, plus the people who are going to be sharing all the forms, right? At least five, six people have to be sharing all the forms. So we have broken it up into different times of the day. Please, please, please tell your parents, try to make it for that time because we're not going to be there whole day and we are required to only have certain amount of people on the compound. It takes one special 
let's use any not very nice words to come and report that Northeastern College has 50 people on the compound, therefore breaking COVID protocol. Right? And then come and arrest everybody on the compound. Right? Yes. That's not, not yes. Um, we had a come with them? No. Okay. Just your parent has to come and sign. So if I were you, I would very, very expressly state what subjects you are writing for the first time in upper six, meaning physics unit two, Caribbean studies, well, Caribbean studies, SBA, right? Geography unit two, transfer, right? Put down everything clearly on what you expect to have now and what you are repeating, resitting, right? From lower six. So write down very clearly on what your parents are supposed to see. We will go through it too, but we can't spend you know, all that time going through it, if considering if you gave your parents the instructions to follow. Now, every year we do have students who still go through the verification. The parents come and check it over and they still sign up for the wrong thing. And um, physics is a new SBA? Physics is an SBA, yes. So you all would have clicked on SBA, right? We don't have a transfer. The only thing we have is reset. Reset is just when you write over the exam and you hold your SBA from last year. And then you have repeat. We went through this already, right? And then we have repeat, right? Then we have repeat where you do over both your SBA and your exam. And remember those of you all who want to hit repeat, you have to speak to the lower six teacher to be allowed into their class to do over the labs. Do not come and run me down. Well, yeah. No, you see, I'm not registered to put lower six students this year. All right? I have unit two recorded under my name, so I cannot sign up any unit one students this year. That's how it works. So it's not to say, you know, you can't come back to me because you cannot come back to me because I am not registered as the unit one teacher this year. All right? So if you all understand what that means and what that says. So I don't think anybody in our class had put down, I think one person had put down to repeat the subject, but everybody else who are writing over the subject are just resetting the exam. So all you're going to do is see reset. All right, so that's going to be next week, Thursday. Tell your parents be on time. If your parents cannot make it, an adult has to go with copies of your parents' ID and a letter of um, authorization. All right, so you all have an entire week to organize that. Tell your parents, organize it quickly. Make sure and have a backup person. All right, now we are not on the compound, so it's not to say, Miss, I can't reach, I could come next week, Tuesday. Nobody's on the compound beside office staff. All right, so we want to get this done quickly. And the thing is, if you come Thursday, if you come Thursday, you will speak to the people who know how to change the forms, as in we understand where the forms are changing, what the values are changing and stuff in the form. If you just send it to the office, Nobody in the office is going to verify that your form is correct and that you've correct, your parents have signed the correct things. They're just going to take it. Okay, they sign ID, good. Your, mm -mm. The verification is to ensure that everything is correct. So please try to get somebody here on Thursday, all right, next week Thursday to come and sign and verify the form. This is the third time you're all doing this, so, you know. Man. Yes. This starts and next week we have to come to find what happened is my mommy can't make it on Monday, but she'll be free Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Sweetheart, and sweetheart, yeah. you all upper six is on Thursday. Okay. I posted okay. I posted the note <laughs> in the Google classroom, the form six classroom, the lower six, the upper six classroom, and I sent it to the PTA chat. So your parents should have it also. Well, I don't think she owned that, and then my Google Classroom just gave trouble. So, you know, I have a type of this I know now. Yeah. Okay, let me stop this recording before I start, you know, those who are watching this. Oh, gosh. Of course.